Welcome to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast brought to you by Proudmouth. I'm your host, Matt Halloran. Being your own loud is not new to marketing, but the mindset, strategies, and resources to help you get there are evolving faster than this industry is keeping up. It is time to find a new perspective on what works why and how to move your business forward. Listen as I interview guests to help you learn from them how to be your own loud. Let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to another Top Advisor Marketing Podcast. Now, I know a lot of you who've listened to this podcast for a while wonder where some of these guests come from. And some of the guests come from LinkedIn and personal connections and private connections, and a lot of times through strategic partnerships. But this one's very personal to me, and I'll tell you why. I have known our guest today since I was 14 years old. And it's so fun to me because where he's gone in life and where I've gone in life are two very, very divergent sort of tracks, but now things are starting to come together. And here's why. So Derek has a PhD, right? So let's start there. So he's way farther advanced than I am in any sort of educational component. He's been a professor for forever. I mean, really, for a really, really long time. But most importantly, he's published three books. He is an app. He's an award winning poet, and he's an amazing creative writer. And I wanted to have him on the show because we have actually hired him to help us write more effectively. And him and I were talking one day, and we were like, holy crap, you know what, maybe, maybe you should do this for some other people, because you've been so successful in doing it with us. So Derek, thanks for being here, brother, and welcome to the show. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And I have to say, uh, you are working with just an exceptional team. And it really is extraordinary to be able to contribute. Man, it was so much fun. We were just talking to Jessica, who's somebody that you work with very deeply. And a lot of our audience knows because she's our director of marketing here. And she just speaks so highly of you. I'm sure that the people who are listening are thinking, oh my God, this guy is a poet and he's published three books. What is he really going to teach us? So Derek, what have you learned from publishing those three books specifically that's applicable to our audience? I think one of the things that's most important to me and one of the, the greatest lessons that I can share is that writing is not a singular endeavor. It is not just something that a single person does. I think we have this myth that as with the artist, as with the director of films, it's one person's vision. One person is making this happen. It's not true at all. All great writing, the best of writing, has everything to do with a team. Whether it's the writer, a writer and an editor, a writer in a writing room. This is not a single person going off into the wilderness to make this happen on her or his own. This involves a team of people. And the sooner you recognize that, and the sooner you can lean into that, the stronger your writing's been going to become, the clearer your message is going to be heard, not just written, but heard. And the more fun you're going to have at this. Because for so many of us, Writing is an agony. Knowing that you have a team to lean on, a group of people that you can turn to, whether it's, am I using the semicolon right here? Is this the right word in this case? If you have the opportunity to, to rest in the knowledge that you got a whole group of people that you can rely upon, your messaging is going to sing. Uh, one of the biggest things I've, I've learned, and again, one of the things I, I try to share out is that writing is not simply an act of expression. It's a, it's a way for us to use our creativity to solve problems, to get at what it is that we need to say in exactly the way we need to say it. Sometimes we're able to do that ourselves. A lot of the times we're not, right? And that's one of the reasons that you have people like me who live and breathe this stuff. I, I mean, that's really it. And I've been, this has been important to me. Language, writing have been important to me since before you and I knew one another. I've been making books since I was a boy. In fact, my mother just sent me several boxes of books. And in those boxes were books that I was making in elementary school, drawings, stories, narratives. What's that, what that has done for me is provided me with the opportunity to work with language at a granular level so that I can tease not just at what it's saying, but how it's saying it. And that too is one of the great things that being able to do this on a daily basis 
gives me insight into, right? Because that's that's one of the biggest differentiators. Moving from, okay, I want to say this to, I know what my audience needs to hear. I know what my clients need to know. How do I speak to them in the language that they are able to hear? And what that amounts to is, and again, this is one of those strange contradictions in the writing process, it's listening. Writing, excuse me, yeah, no, I think that's a good way of putting it. Writing is a listening outward. And the deeper we're able to listen, the closer we're able to get to the audience, the reader, the client, the customer, again, the more transparent, the more effective, the more comforting, the more engaging, the more interesting the the writing becomes. Yeah. I, I'm really biased and I'm sure it doesn't surprise everybody because I've known you for so long, but I love pretty much everything you've ever written. I've always been really fascinated with the process. When I wrote the social media handbook for financial advisors, I met with the editor at Bloomberg. I sent her what I wrote. <laughs> then she sent it back and she said, here's what I'd like to change. I need you to approve this. And I said, what, what, what are you talking about? I need to approve what? Aren't you the, prof you're the professional, right? You're the one who makes my mumbo jumbo sound amazing. And a lot of the people who are listening to this are probably thinking to themselves, boy, I've probably written some pretty bad mumbo jumbo that's out in the, the world. When you're creating a poem, right? So you've got your, your latest book that just came out. It's a book of poetry. And, and when you're writing a poem, how does that same process apply to writing for financial services or people with a, a very strong amount of expertise? Creativity means business. I mean, that's it. Again, the work that I find myself doing, whether I am working for Constellar Creative, whether I'm partnering uh, with other organizations, all of that work has to do with creative problem solving, getting at what it is that needs to be articulated. Poetry, interestingly enough, because more often than not, it dislocates us from the language of the everyday, allows, it, allows us to see it differently, right? Allows us to start to examine the ways in which we think, right? It's not just what we say on the page or screen, it's how we're thinking. Poetry invites us to look at language differently. And although the poet W.H. Auden is often misquoted, poetry makes nothing happen, right? The line goes on, right? He talks about how, in fact, this is in an elegy to, to William Butler Yeats, the Irish poet who had recently passed away. Auden goes on to say that, that language persists, right? And that poetry has a, a space that is unending. It gets us thinking in new ways. And it has been my experience that once you start looking at things differently, change can happen. And that to me is key. I think we do a disservice to all of the work that each of us does when we try to compartmentalize it in these ways, right? I mean, if we're serious about business, whatever business means, what we're really talking about is not hooking our audience, not trying to reel people in. I want to put as much pressure on that concept as possible, because what that equals is short-term gain and a really catastrophic reputation. People don't want to be treated that way. I love the fact that that is how, although I will never thank the pandemic for anything, that is how business is happening in the Knockwood nearly post-pandemic economy. People want to be treated with dignity. They want to be respected. And this is one of the ways that we can rise to meet the people with whom we work is by using our words in ways that create environments in which good can be done. This is transformative to me, but it has been my experience both inside the classroom and out that when people start through language, when they start to read carefully, when they start to write deliberately, it may still equate to mumbo jumbo, as you said, 
But that authenticity and that desire to connect, that's a difference maker. That changes everything. And that's what poetry has meant and continues to mean to me. It is the opportunity to experience language in a different way. And through that experience, transform the way we think through that, transform the world in which we live. Yeah. Now, you just talked about being in the classroom, right? And so so in my intro, you know, I did talk about the fact that you were a professor forever. You have a PhD. We really leaned heavily on that, the fact that you had taught people creative writing and poetry for so long, because well, just full disclosure for everybody, we had actually hired Derek to come in and teach our team to write even more effectively, and then also create ways to make sure that they're maintaining that level of quality of writing. But what sort of stuff can you bring from the classroom, Derek? into a professional's office to help them have a better voice and also help their team write more successfully? For over 20 years, I've found myself every five months, roughly speaking, walking into a room full of anywhere from 10 to 40 complete strangers, many of whom do not want to be there, many of whom are deeply resistant to an English class, there's a great hesitancy there. I've had to overcome that over and again. One of the things that that has taught me, other than an incredible sense of empathy, because Lord knows there are a lot of things that I have not been able to do. There are a lot of things that I have not been able to do well in my life. The last thing I want is for somebody who walks into a situation like that, thinking I'm bad at this. Because truth is, that's probably exactly what they have been told up to the point that I start working with them. I'm bad at this. Truth is, if they go back, if they go, if they have the great good fortune to have a box sent to them that shows them what they were doing when they were five, six years old, they would be astonished at the level of clarity, excitement, the creativity they were showing. Writing is not easy. That's the first thing, right, for me to establish. I may have a facility with it. That comes from working with it for 40 plus years, day in and day out, because at an early age, for whatever reason, I showed an interest and my passion was encouraged by the people in my life. Was I great at it? Am I great at it now? I think the jury's out on that. I'd like to think so. In terms of being able to, to work with your listeners, I can assure them I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> but what I'll say is so many people come into the situation thinking I can't do it. I'm bad at it. I'm here with you today because I continued to work on that. I held to that passion. And that's the thing in encountering rooms full of strangers who are like, I, I don't want to be here. I don't like you. This is hell to me. In order to create buy-in, which I have successfully done over and again, what do I do? I'm not going to teach you the subject. I I'm going to love it if 10 years from now, you're able to point to a poem by Emily Dickinson and say that I've been carrying that poem with me for 10 years. Mm. What matters to me is that you come away from that experience with a renewed enthusiasm and with an understanding that, you know what, as hard as this is, I can do it. <laughs> I can totally do it, right? Now, one of the things that I can do is if you get to that point and you're like, I actually can't do it, I can do it for you, <laughs> right? <laughs> one of the other things I can do though is I can teach you, I can teach your team to do it for yourselves. And I can do that by reminding you of your own enthusiasms. Even if you're, if they're not writing based, even if you're thinking, you know what? I tr I've tried, I've really tried to like books. I've really tried to like writing and I don't. It doesn't mean you're a bad writer and it doesn't mean you can't do it. What it means is we got to figure out a way to approach it differently. We have to think about a way to activate that differently. So if your thing is, hiking, you're like, I don't ever want to be around a book again in my life. 
you still want to be able to talk to people about hiking. If it's being able to inform someone, say of like the fact that they really need to be thinking about their retirement when they're like 20 years old, you think to yourself, I, I don't like writing. I'm not good at it. I do. Here's the thing. What you love to do is you love to provide that knowledge and service to somebody else. What we're going to do is we're going to strategize about how to make sure that saying that does not seem to be a burden anymore. And again, if, if we sit down, we have that conversation. If we wind up talking about and creating pathways to successful writing and you're, you come back three months later and you're like, you know what? I still hate this. I'm around. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. I'm, I'm here to, 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 to do that work. What thrills me most though, is to be able to, to empower other people and show other people how to do it for themselves. Because again, that creates positive change. And of the two options, I'm always for positive change. Yeah, so there's yeah. been enough negative change in the world already. Yeah. Now, you said this earlier, it's been knocking around in my brain. I don't know if you can hear that because it's hollow up there about this whole idea of listening. What, what, what does that mean? How do you use that as your, it sounds like that's such a huge foundation of, of not only how you teach, but also how you write. What do you mean by that? I think it's really hard for us in a world, and I can't even imagine. I mean, you and I are of a generation where we still remember a world without mobile devices, without so many of the technology we, technologies we use on a daily basis. I think it's, it's hard enough for us. I can't even imagine being a digital native, being surrounded by so much information, so much noise, right? I mean, I'm, I'm someone who, and not simply because I'm a writer, I just, it's my temperament. I really love silence. And we were talking a bit before about poetry and poetics, which is, you know, your sort of philosophy and practice of, of poetry. If I'm able ever to write in the way as a creative writer, as a poet, as an essayist, if I'm ever able to get to the point I want to get to, I will be writing silence. Right? That is my poetics, to write as close to silence as possible. Now, as with so much of what you and I are talking about, it sounds a little batshit crazy and <laughs> it sounds it sounds completely reversed. I mean, the last thing you want in an environment that is saturated with noise is to be quiet. But as with so much that's been going on these past 18 months, I think we're finally catching on to the fact that received wisdom was completely off track. We were wrong to ridicule and malign quiet and quietude, right? You want to be loud. Being bold is one thing. And I can't tell you, I am all about celebrating boldness. But that boldness must be grounded in quiet, right? Because that's where your authority derives from, is in your ability not just to have thoughts and to, to write them, to say them but in your ability to marshal them. And this gets back to writing for your audience in a way that they can hear you because it's not just about writing in their voice. It's not just about speaking to them. It's about engaging them in a way that they can hear what it is that you have to say. And that to me, that just requires quite a bit of this. Mm. Dead air as we would call it, right? In the radio mm -hmm. business. I encourage as much dead air as you can make in your life because there is so much noise going on. But if we can start to hear silence, then we can start to, for all intents and purposes, take control of our thoughts. And if we can start to take greater control of our thoughts, we can start to take greater control of how we articulate or express those thoughts. Once we do that, again, we're at a stage where we're not writing. What we're doing is we're initiating a dialogue. If you want to talk about the metrics of successful writing, that is it right there. If you're creating resonance, if you're making space for dialogue to happen, you're changing the world. Whether that's happening as it did, you know, I don't know how, 
I, I really don't. And I, I've been studying it for quite some time. This has been, I don't know how David Ogilvy managed to do what he did as well as he did, other than the fact that he kept at it and kept at it. You look at those headlines, they're clarion calls, right? They are so not just succinct, they say so much. They are so efficient and concise. Again, that's somebody, even though he defined much of the noise that we hear today, that's somebody writing close to silence. That's somebody who's listening close enough so that he can hear. And it's what he's hearing that that becomes then what he winds up writing. And that's what we wind up reading. The people who listen to the show they, they spend the majority of their time listening and then they don't take what they're hearing and turn that into content because they have this feverish pace that they think they have to keep up with. And what we're finding, and one of the reasons why we wanted to bring you on board to help us write more effectively was because we wanted it to feel like we were having a conversation, not talking at people. And I think that's the, that's the whole idea of Proudmouth rising above the noise is because there is so much noise and by having clear, effective, poignant word choice makes it so different. So it doesn't feel like you're just vomiting all over your clients with knowledge. I'm air quoting there or just words or whatever. Can you guys imagine if somebody read your stuff and thought to themselves, Wow. Like, like, wow. Like, like that was so well written that I actually understand what you're talking about instead of using all of these contrite phrases and all of this crap that's out there. And that's one of the reasons why I believe that bringing somebody like you on board to provide that guidance, uh, provide that extra set of eyes is so important. Now you did say something on LinkedIn, then I hope everybody takes a minute to follow Derek Pollard on LinkedIn. We're going to make sure that we have links to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes. But you talked a lot about the content is king component. And it's interesting because of everything that you just said still leads to the the understanding that content is king. But you're just talking about it a little bit differently. Can you elaborate on what you talked about in that post and why that's such a cornerstone of what you want to offer to the community? Content is queen is what you're referring nice. to. Yes. Yeah, Bill, you got it wrong. I think Bill Gates, in, in writing that article, got a lot right. Clearly, <laughs> Bill Gates, in writing that yeah. article, got a lot right. But I will say, and, and this is in response to our shifting awareness in the world, again, as people, not as, not as, as employees, not as customers, uh, not as consumers, as people. When we're doing this right, when we're doing it well, we're listening to each other. And that's sparking new ways of looking at ourselves, of looking at others. And I think it's just long overdue. And I am hardly alone in this. I, I am hardly alone. And also, too, I don't for a second pretend that I am the voice of expertise in this matter at all. There are so many people whose voices matter so much more than mine do in relation to this. But man alive, is it ever long overdue that we make more space for women, particularly in this field, as we make more space for the LGBTQ plus community, that we make more space for uh, communities of color, in these profession, in the work that we do, because again, that's the world in which we live. If you are invested in a siloed approach, not just to your work, not just in terms of your, but to being a person, you're just missing out. There is so much you stand to gain by stepping back and hearing what other people have to say. That, again, we're not just talking about writing here. We're not just talking about messaging. We're not talking about, I mean, we are talking about those things, but we're talking about them in the context of a new, the new normal, right? We are there. We've arrived. And again, although I am not going to thank the pandemic for anything, 
that accelerated our awareness of how vital it is to open up more space to other voices, voices that have been with us that we have just not picked up on, that we have not had the good sense and the wisdom to listen to. We are suddenly starting to hear them and to recognize how much more, how much richer our world is for having those voices part of the decision-making process, to have those voices part of the, the, the constitution of, of new entrepreneurial endeavors, to have that part of the conversation about financial planning, right? Moving people, empowering people into a position where they're taking control of that aspect of their lives. The more voices we have, the, the, the different perspectives that we can welcome, the, the better the conversation, the cooler the party, Ultimately, the more we all stand to gain. And again, that really, to me, is one of the messages that I want to underscore is we are totally in all of this together, whether that's a writing assignment, whether that's staking a space for your business, whether that's getting to a point where you're able to recognize and, and amplify your brand. What we're talking about here are finding ways to connect with other people so that we can make good things happen in a world where it just seems increasingly like there's very little other than bad things going on. Oh. Now, if you could wave a magic wand and, and really get your message directly to who your ideal person is, who should reach out to you? What, what sort of firm would you like to work with? I mean, just again, we hired you, we're retaining you, you've made our communication better. And as a communications company, that seems kind of important, <laughs> right? And honestly, Derek, and you know this very, very well, is financial advisors are in the business of communicating. And that's what they need to do. And they need to do it as effectively as possible. So who should reach out to you? And then what is the best way for them to do that? Anybody who's interested in finding ways to create dialogue, whether you're a sole proprietor, whether you're a company, a, an advising firm that has 10 to 50 employees, but whether you classify yourself as a world beater in the industry, I'm really interested in working with people who are themselves interested in connecting people to resources, connecting people to information, informing people and helping them build skills. Because again, I, I mean, the truth of the matter is the work all of us are doing has, is all about empowering others to be able to take greater control of their own lives. Whether we're talking about communication, whether we're talking about the, their financial health and security, what we're talking about here is empowering people to do it that much better. And I have to tell you again, as somebody who has been in the college classroom for over 20 years, my goodness gracious, on both sides of that, I don't even want to talk about it, right? <laughs> but as somebody who's experienced that, there is nothing more rewarding than being able to empower someone to then go on to take that new knowledge, that new awareness, that new way of doing something and sharing that out with somebody else. The opportunity to give a skill to somebody or simply to wake them up to a skill that they already had. That's one of the other things. When I find myself in that situation at the beginning of a new term and everyone's like, I don't like this. <laughs> I don't want to be here. That's one of the things that I make sure that they know is that this is not that evaluative dialogue that you're having with yourself in your head, that doesn't have a place here. What we're after is giving you the skills to be able to take control of those aspects of your life that you felt alienated from so that you can start to take greater control of your voice because your voice, more than mine, your voice is going to be what matters most. And that's what's going to be what drives change. If that's where you are at, again, as an individual, trying to build a client base as a company. If you want to create those conversations and provide those opportunities to others, to connect them to what's going to help them now, but even more so to have them come back to you three, five, 10 years later and say, you know that thing you told me about that one time? Because I reached out to you because you were the person that I felt I could trust 
in that moment, right? When I had no clue what it meant to be in control of this aspect of my life, you reached me in a particular way. I got in touch with you. Because of that, I learned how to do this. And I just taught that to my own son, my own daughter. I just taught that to my nephew. I had a neighbor who was struggling with that issue. I was able to tell him or her how to take care of it. I was able to show them the resources that you pointed me to. There's nothing like that, yeah. right? You're building at that point, you're not just building a relationship with a client, you're building a legacy that you both share in. And that's what the majority of people that we have listening, not only do for their clients, but also they want to do for themselves, right? They want to build something that's greater than, than just one person. We're going to make sure that we have all of the links to your website, also to your LinkedIn profile, just to kind of close things out today. One of the things that we heard from our team, uh, and we hire professional writers, I just want to be clear. So the people who were in the room with Derek were people who loved the English classes. Every one of them walked away and said, I look, I'm now looking at things a little bit differently, which is going to make me a more effective writer. And you as a financial services professional, I want you to pause and think, when is the last time that you invested money into your team and your marketing department to make sure that you were writing as effectively as you possibly could? And I'm telling you right now, you haven't. And the reason why is because there haven't been a lot of people in this space. In fact, there are very, very few who have not only the technical expertise, the teaching experience, and also the understanding of the industry to truly be able to bring something like this to your firm to make you communicate as effectively as you can. So Derek, I want to say thank you very much for taking some time and chatting with our audience. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And it's a wonderful way to continue a conversation that's been going on for 30 plus years. <laughs> yeah. All right, brother. For Derek Pollard here, the founder of Constellar Creative, and make sure you follow him on LinkedIn. And for all of us here at Proudmouth, here is to a much better writing experience, reading experience, and communication experience by utilizing somebody who's an expert to make you sound better than you ever could imagine that you might sound. And for that, we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Thanks for listening to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast brought to you by Proudmouth. If you want to learn more about how you can be your own loud, visit our website, read our blog posts, attend our educational webinars, and sign up for our new Influence Accelerator Academy, where you too can learn how to truly be an influencer in your space. Have a wonderful day.